Welcome. Our newly created webinar series called ASG Global Spotlight. This new series was created with our global audience in mind and at a different time from our usual offerings to make sure that you all have a chance to join live. These webinars will feature global experts in their field, and I'm very excited for today's presentation. We have attendees joining us from all over the world, and the American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy appreciates your participation. Today's event is entitled Esophageal Cancer in Africa, Relevance for ASG Members. The discussion of this webinar will focus on problem of squamous cell esophageal cancer in East Africa, remote endoscopic teaching and learning, and also you can find out ways you can become involved in the program. My name is Redi Yakova, and I will be the facilitator for this presentation. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. There will be a question and answer session at the close of the presentation. Questions can be submitted at any time online by clicking the Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen. Once you click on their feature, you can type in your question and hit return to submit the message. Please note that this presentation is being recorded and will be posted within two business days on GI Leap, ASGE's online learning platform you will have ongoing access to the recording in GLEAP as part of your registration. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our two moderators for today, Dr. Violet Kayamba, who is a medical gastroenterologist at the University of Zambia School of Medicine in Lusaka, and Dr. David Fleischer, who is an emeritus physician at Mayo Clinic, Arizona, and the professor of medicine at College of Medicine, Mayo Clinic. Dr. Fleischer is a master endoscopist and a recipient of Rudolf V. Schindler Award by ASGE. He is acknowledged for his pioneering work with laser therapy for esophageal cancer, band litigation, and snare polectomy for pre-malignant esophageal lesions, video endoscopy, capsule endoscopy, and radio frequency ablation for Barrett's esophagus. Dr. Fleischer has published more than 300 original articles and editorials and has edited several books. He has lectured throughout the United States and internationally and has spoken on all seven continents, including Antarctica. Some of you may know him for his roles in Hollywood productions, such as uh, 30 Minutes of Less, Venom, Zombieland, Double Tap, just to name a few. Uh, we could really spend uh, the whole hour talking about uh, Dr. Fleischer's achievements but we are very fortunate and honored to have him and Dr. Kamba present today's webinar. Now I will hand the presentation over to him. Good, well, welcome everyone uh, to the Global Spotlight webinar. Uh, I'll be co-moderating this with uh, my good friend, Violet Kamba, who is at the University of Zambia. Uh, importantly for this talk, and Dr. Dossi will get into what Af what an AFRAC is. It's different than that AFLAC uh, thing you see on commercials about insurance, but AFRAC, the American, excuse me, the African Esophageal Cancer Consortium, and uh, Violet currently serves as the chair. So she's been a uh, heart and soul of the, of the uh, AFRAC. Uh, and uh, Violet will be with us. And uh, hello to Violet. The uh, way that this is set up, and um, the overview has been given by Reddy, is really to say to you, if um, you wanted to know about uh, esophageal cancer in Africa, and specifically the role of the African Esophageal Cancer Consortium, and you wanted to know how this uh, project goes on both in real time and with remote, uh, this is the place to be, and these are the four people you'd want to hear from that. Uh, Dr. Dossi, uh, who I'll introduce formally in a second, is uh, will give a background. Uh, Dr. Hilary Tapazian will talk about the actual capacity and boots on the ground and who's there, and uh, she was a lead author in the most important study that's been done recently to assess the resources uh, for managing esophageal cancer as well as endoscopy, uh, endoscopic issues in, in uh, many countries in East Africa. Uh, Dr. Wei, uh, who again, I'll introduce formally, 
has uh, been the leader in a remote program for teaching and education that I think is uh, sets both not the standard for only for now, but what the future will be. And, uh, and Dr. Machiro, who's at Tenwick, who's a surgeon there and head of the endoscopy, and again, I'll introduce Mike formally, has been the uh, uh, driving spirit uh, in terms of the teaching programs. You'll hear from all of those. So uh, this is a program, if this is of interest to you, you'll, uh, you, you won't, you couldn't just go into a, a, a grab bag and pick four people to be better to do this. Um, we'll begin the program with Dr. Dossie. Uh, Dr. Dossie is a close personal friend of mine. His position is as a uh, senior investigator. Actually, uh, hello, Violet. Hello, hello, everyone. Hi, hi Violet, welcome. Uh, uh, Violet is, as I mentioned, is uh, the actually the head of the AFREC steering committee and is uh, on the faculty and a very important faculty at the University of Zambia. She'll have the first introduction uh, for, for, uh, for Dr. Dossi. Violet, welcome and uh, take it away. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David. Now, I think um, I've just joined in. I think you must have already uh, said uh, something about Dr. Dorsey. I'm very happy to introduce him as our first speaker for this session. Uh, Dr. Dorsey, please. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this morning, I would like to uh, have a brief overview of esophageal cancer in Africa and the development of the African Esophageal Cancer Consortium, or AFREC. Esophageal cancer is the sixth leading cause of cancer death in the world, killing about 500,000 people each year. 85% of these cases are in developing countries, and 85% are esophageal squamous cell carcinoma. One of the characteristic features of esophageal cancer is its unusual geographic distribution with distinct high-risk belts across Central Asia and down the east coast of Africa. The risk in these areas is 10 to 50 times the risk in low-risk populations, and 90% of the cases are esophageal squamous cell carcinoma. In low-risk populations, uh, to the 90% of the risk for esophageal squamous cell carcinoma are due to tobacco and heavy alcohol consumption. In the United States, the hazard ratio for current tobacco smoking is nine, and the hazard ratio for drinking more than three alcoholic drinks per day is about five. In high-risk populations, however, tobacco and alcohol are much less important, at least, by, at least today with hazard ratios uh, around one. Instead, there is a list of other risk factors that seem to be more important, including diet, especially a low selenium diet, tobacco carcinogens such as polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons from non-tobacco sources, hot temperature drinks, and poor oral health, which we think is related to an abnormal oral microbiome. In Africa, there is a clear high-risk corridor for esophageal cancer along the East Coast, and this area is significantly understudied. One striking feature, however, is the young age of many of the cases. 20% of the cases are under the age of 40. For example, at Tenwick Hospital in Western Kenya, they see about 400 ESCC cases each year, and they have a much younger age distribution than in Asia, Europe, or the Americas. As you can see in the bar graph, where the Tenwick cases are in black and the US cases from the SEER registry are in gray, the Tenwick cases are dramatically shifted to the left to younger ages. At this hospital, 17% of the cases are under the age of 40, 7% are under 30, and 1% are under 20 years old. 90% of the patients are unresectable and need palliation. 
Other hospitals in the African ESCC high-risk corridor report similar findings. In 2017, a group of African and international investigators working on ESCC in Africa uh, got together and formed the African Esophageal Cancer Consortium, or AFREC. The goals of this consortium are to raise awareness of ESCC in Africa, to support young African researchers, to coordinate case control studies, GWAS studies, and genomic studies, to coordinate training and capacity building, to make affordable stents available throughout Africa, and to develop early detection and treatment programs. This is our organizational chart. We have a full membership group, we have a steering committee, and we have working groups on etiologic studies, clinical studies, and advocacy and awareness. Currently, we have 10 collaborating sites in six countries, which you can see on the uh, map. We have five international members, including NCI, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, UC San Francisco, UNC, and the Mayo Clinic. We have bi-monthly conference calls with 20 to 30 people on each call. And we have in-person meetings every two years at AORTIC, or the African Organization for Research and Training in Cancer. This is not a uh, cardiology conference. We currently have seven case control studies, two of which are finished and five ongoing for a total of 2,400 uh, cases and controls. We've harmonized the questionnaires into five ongoing case control studies so that the results can be better compared and possibly combined. We have a mobile phone app for primary capture of all data. Uh, we also are doing a joint GWAS study up and down the, the high-risk belt, collecting saliva as a DNA source. And by the end of this year, we will have screened 2,000 cases and 2,000 controls. And we're biobanking uh, tissues and other biosamples for genomic studies. Finally, we have in endoscopic capacity surveys, which you'll hear about in a minute. We're partnering with Boston Scientific to provide access to affordable stents and stent insertion training, which you'll also hear about later on. And we do quality of life and survival studies. So today you're gonna to hear from Hilary Tapazian on the AFRIC endoscopy capacity study, from Dr. Wei on remote endoscopy teaching in Africa, and from Mike Machiro on the AFRIC stent access initiative. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, before I introduce uh, Dr. Tapazian, a few background information about uh, Dr. Dossi. Uh, he uh, is reporting on his work in uh, East Africa, but uh, Sandy actually started his work in China in the 1980s. Uh, he's done similar work in Iran, South Africa, and throughout the world. And uh, as I've said on other fora, there's no one that I know who uh, has been done more or been more involved for uh, work related to this than, than Dr. Dossi. So Sandy, thank you for your presentations. And when we get to the uh, question and answers, if there's anything you wanna know either about uh, esophageal cancer uh, around the world, the NCI, are uh, the Washington National Baseball Team, Sandy's your guy to uh, speak to that. Uh, I wanna remind everyone that there's an opportunity for questions and answers. And so feel free at any time to um, uh, start sending in the questions and answers. We'll have time for those at the end uh, as we go forward. The second speaker um, is Hillary Tapazian. Uh, Hillary, uh, uh, first worked with uh, esophageal cancer uh, when she was at Tenwick Hospital, uh, where uh, Mike Machiro is and uh, others. Uh, her father, who's Mark Tapazian, who is a, uh, a well-known to many, uh, put in some of the very first stents that were put in in uh, Tenwick. And since then, there's been approximately 4,000. So 
Mark probably put in numbers uh, six, seven, and eight through 23. And then uh, Mike and Russ White and others took over from that time. She then uh, did cancer control work at the NCI, uh, just recently finished her doctorate at the University of North Carolina, and will be getting her uh, postdoctoral work at the uh, uh, Imperial College in London, from which she speaks. Uh, her topic uh, is uh, endoc and endoscopic capacity study, and you really can't have an intelligent conversation about how you address any medical issue, any cancer issue, unless you have some background information. Uh, and none of that had uh, been done uh, in a sophisticated way until Hillary's uh, uh, study, which is uh, she'll discuss with us. So welcome, Hillary, and uh, we look forward to your commentary. All right. Um, well, I'm just going to be presenting today on behalf of a large number of people, including Mike, who's on the call as well. Um, and I'm going to be presenting on the AFREC endoscopy capacity study, which was an effort to quantify available endoscopy capacity and to qualitatively assess barriers to performance and access to care in four of our AFREC consortium countries, Ethiopia, Kenya, Malawi, and Zambia. The objectives of our study were to first estimate the number of endoscopists practicing in our four countries of interest and to assess the extent of their training, scope of practice, and characterize the health facilities where they practice. Second, we wanted to determine the amount of functioning GI equipment in use. And finally, we wanted to compare the endoscopy capacity of these countries with published data from the rest of the world. So to do this, we developed an online survey using Google Forms which we targeted towards health providers practicing endoscopy. And we created standardized questions across countries and tweaked them slightly in each location to address differences in terminology. And the survey was developed by our AFRIC country champions with input from other health providers within each country. We sent out the survey link via email invitations in partnership with medical and surgical societies of each country, and then distributed the link to the practicing endoscopists using the society membership list. And we sent periodic reminders throughout the study period, which ran from August 2018 to August 2020. And this was primarily a descriptive study um, with analysis conducted at the individual and facility levels. And we adjusted our estimates for non-response. So a total of 87 individuals participated in our survey and reported working from a at a total of 91 health facilities. And each individual could record up to three health facilities where they practice and then also list additional locations where they know that services are offered in their country. And the health facilities are mapped on the left with the size of the bubble indicating the number of survey respondents from each city. The response rate for the survey was only 25% as we distributed the survey link to all members of surgical and medical societies. And this created a large denominator, even though many members of these societies never perform endoscopy. But despite this rate, we were still able to capture information on 82% of all facilities listed by respondents. Most participants in our survey were surgeons or MD non-surgeons. Respondents were from both public and private institutions with 46% from the public sector and a quarter practicing in both capacities. 73.6% of participants performed endoscopy procedures. And most performed diagnostic EGD and colonoscopy, but there were very few participants who practiced ERCP or EUS. Respondents had been performing endoscopy for a median of five years and performed 10 upper GI endoscopies and three lower GI endoscopies per week on average. Of the 91 health facilities where survey participants practiced, 65 were private facilities and only nine were mission and 17 were public facilities. Mission hospitals tended to have more functioning gastroscopes, but all facility types had similar numbers of functioning colonoscopes. Public facilities had the highest capacity for upper GI procedures per week and lower GI procedures, but this did not reach statistical significance. Uh, one of the key findings from this table are that endoscopy fees are much lower at public facilities at 12 and 34 US dollars for diagnostic and therapeutic endoscopy. Whereas at mission and private hospitals, the average cost ranges into hundreds of dollars. And another one of our objectives was to compare the endoscopy capacity from our survey countries to that of high resource countries. So we calculated estimates taking into account each country's population size and our survey response rates. So for example, to calculate the number of endoscopists, 
we divided the number of survey respondents saying they performed endoscopy by a total population of 206 million, and then extrapolated using the survey response rates. So the adjusted survey values are shown in blue. And then using published literature, we found comparison values for the West Cape province in South Africa, the US and the Netherlands. And comparing all these values, we calculated the relative capacity of our survey countries to these high income locations and found that endoscopy capacity in East Africa is only one to 10% of the capacity reported from resource rich countries. For instance, there's only 10 and 4.8% of endoscopists per 100,000 people in our survey countries compared to the US and the Netherlands. There is also only one functioning gastroscope for every 400,000 to 1.3 million persons in participating countries, which is less than 10% of the minimum number of gastroscopes that we calculated are needed to support current endoscopy practice volumes in the US and the Netherlands. Additionally, the maximum upper GI capacity in our survey countries is only 5.8 and 8.1% of that in the US and Netherlands, and 1.4 and 3.0% of the lower GI procedure capacity. Broad barriers to endoscopy are listed in the table shown on this slide. A lack of functioning endoscopy equipment and supplies, as well as cost of equipment, procedures, and insurance were reported as barriers by most, most individuals within all countries. And closely following were personnel issues, including a lack of trained endoscopists and support staff. Endoscope procurement varies by country, but facility level purchases are common and donations are an important source of endoscopes. Most respondents report limited or no access to endoscope repair. Nearly half of respondents must send their endoscopes to another continent for repair, and a quarter have no access to repair or else attempt self-repair. Many must also look outside of their facility for funds to pay for endoscope repair. And when funds are available, they usually come from research grants, the government, a donor, or the endoscopist themselves. So in summary, our study of health professionals in Ethiopia, Kenya, Malawi, and Zambia gave us the first national picture of endoscopy capacity in four of our Africa consortium countries. We found that endoscopy capacity in our target population includes 1.2 endoscopists, 1.2 gastroscopes, and 0.9 colonoscopes per 1 million people, and adjusted maximum upper and lower GI endoscopy capacity for 106 and 45 procedures per 100,000 people per year. And these values represent only one to 10% of the capacity reported from the United States and the Netherlands. So these results led us to conclude that endoscopy capacity is severely limited in Eastern Sub-Saharan Africa, despite a high burden of GI disease among the population, as Sandy mentioned previously. And expanding capacity requires investment in human and material resources and technological innovations. Our results provide a starting point for measuring the impact of Africa's activities to improve physical infrastructure, human capacity, training, and efforts to lower costs for procedures and supplies. And these results also highlight gaps which future Africa activities could help to fill. And I just wanna end by thanking our country champions pictured who helped with the survey development and implementation. And of course, all the participants who took the time to contribute data to our project. Thank you. Thank you, Hillary. Uh, <clears throat> I'll be uh, introducing the next speaker and then Dr. Kayamba will uh, <clears throat> follow with the uh, final speaker of the group before we get to questions. I want to remind folks that uh, you have an ability to ask questions. We've received uh, uh, two questions so far, but again, most of the uh, time for these uh, uh, webinars and seminars, uh, the questions really get to what you want to know as opposed to what the speakers think you ought to know. So fire at us and uh, we'll handle the questions uh, for sure that you put forward. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, it's been apparent that remote uh, interactions through businesses and schools and just about every uh, uh, function of daily life is critical. Uh, one of the things that had characterized the AFRAC uh, training and teaching program before had been hands-on participation by uh, uh, different experts who came to Africa to teach and to learn from the sites who uh, may have had more experience than they, but the interaction was critical. That was cut off by the pandemic, and so uh, remote education became important. Uh, Dr. Jerome Way, who's a professor emeritus at Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, 
um, has been a leader in that area. And when you talk about uh, individuals that you're introducing, uh, one of the common phrases for someone's well known is to say, literally, this person needs no introduction. And probably of all the uh, colleagues with whom I work, that applies more to Jerry Way than to anyone else. Um, in addition to his uh, work with uh, endoscopic teaching and training, he's been a leader in, in ways that few have. Uh, to be president of one of the GI societies is quite an accomplishment. Jerry is just about the only person I know who's been the president of uh, three GI societies. He has president, been president of the ASGE, president of the American College of Gastroenterology, and also president uh, of the World Endoscopy Organization. Uh, there's no one who I think is a better teacher or ambassador uh, than Jerry is. And when you see his presentation, you'll be aware of that. The one thing I want to warn you about if something uh, seems to disappear during his slides, uh, many of you know who know Jerry know about his, how gregarious he is and how good he is with people. But some of you may not know that he's actually a professional magician. And uh, his uh, odd crowds, not only with his medical expertise, but with his magic. So as they say in the... Uh, musical Pippin, there's magic to do. And uh, Jerry will talk to us about remote training and uh, for endoscopy. Jerry, welcome and thank you for participating. Thank you, David. That was a wonderful introduction. I'd like to uh, discuss remote endoscopy training with you. Uh, three years ago, the uh, director of surgery at Mount Sinai in New York wanted to bring surgery to an area where there was no possibility of surgical interaction. He chose a small community in Uganda called Kiabira, which is four hours away from Kampala, the capital. Um, I don't seem to be able to move that. Uh... He uh, picked this community. It had uh, no paved roads. Um, next slide, please. It had no uh, indoor plumbing nor uh, sewer capabilities. Next slide, please. Uh, cooking was done by um, uh, a wood fire in an outside shed outside from the home. And um, it was done with a, next slide, please. It was done with a pot balanced on three stones, typically. Uh, being fed by a wood fire underneath uh, the pot between the stones. So this was the community in which he, uh, next slide please, built this uh, surgical facility, uh, which has uh, two operating rooms, um, a wonderful, very modern recovery room. It has um, intake areas, treatment areas, administrative areas, and uh, there is a, um, an ambulance that um, can go to the patient's home and follow up from this uh, ambulatory surgical facility uh, is done locally by a nurse who travels by their uh, own motorcycle. Next slide, please. The ORs are uh, fully equipped for operating capacities. Two ORs uh, with having uh, anesthesia capability as well. Dr. Marin asked me to come to Uganda to teach endoscopy, uh, which I did, next slide please, in um, early 2020. Olympus lent a tower with an upper and lower scope, next slide please. And I traveled to Uganda to uh, teach six surgeons in the techniques of upper and lower endoscopy. We spent an intensive week uh, familiarizing them with uh, endoscopy, with lectures, videos, and actual hands-on, everybody got hands-on experience. Next slide, please. When I returned home, Dr. Marin asked me to continue to train uh, his endoscopist at the uh, Kiyobira Surgical Center, which I did. Here I am at home 
watching the procedures and uh, there is a camera on the operator's hands and a view of the um, scope uh, output. And I can have instant communication with the, uh, with the operators as he uh, goes about the uh, end of the procedure. It's actually very similar to being in the same room as uh, the operator, just like being in the endoscopy room at Mount Sinai Hospital with one of the uh, GI fellows. I can instruct him directly, he hears me, I can see what he's doing, and I can see what, uh, what the scope is doing as well. Now, what's the difference between teaching and training, actually? Next slide, please. Teaching is different. Uh, teaching is uh, providing education. It's not very rigid. It usually refers to classroom learning, where training is hands-on and practical. It's intended to develop a abilities, and exercises are repeated so that the operator learns how to do it. Um, and it uh, helps already knowledgeable person to learn new tools and techniques. But what does this mean for us? Next slide, please. The implication for GI endoscopy is teaching is like a three-day course that you attend with lots of live demo, um, and they show all the latest things that can be done, where training is actually side-by-side -side repeated instruction, such as uh, fellow training in endoscopy. And that's the sort of thing that uh, we can do with remote endoscopy teaching. Next slide, please. So here I am uh, watching what's, uh, what's happening. Next slide, please. Um, I was able to um, guide the endoscopist uh, step by step through advancing the biopsy forceps into that small lumen in this patient with obstructing a squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus. I could instruct him to uh, go right a little bit, advance the forces, put it in that aperture, uh, twist the scope clockwise, take a biopsy specimen, uh, and then uh, uh, put it in, a, in formalin for pathology. Next slide, please. Uh, the image transmission is excellent as seen in this iPhone recorded video where a small round worm was found in the duodenum. This round worm was captured with forceps and removed. The transmission of both video and voice had no perceptible lag despite the distance between computers. Next slide, please. So here is the uh, schema of uh, what, uh, what we need to do remote endoscopy. Uh, you'll see that at the very top, at the very top is a Logitech rally system, and we'll explain all of that to you, but it uh, has its own camera and a small computer that, uh, that comes with this whole system. We also need a, a um, connector to change the output from the Olympus system, which is SDI, which means serial digital interface to USB, which is what's uh, found on uh, your laptop. So we need a converter here. And once we have that, the next thing we need is a microphone for the uh, surgeon to, uh, to speak. So let me show you what this, uh, what this means. Next slide, please. Here is the uh, lapel microphone. Next slide, please. Here is a connection from the SDI output from the endoscope. This cable goes to the uh, Inagini converter. Next slide, which is here. So the cable comes from the endoscope tower to the converter and then out. Next slide, please. And out to the laptop. So we get a, uh, a signal directly from the endoscope output to the laptop. Next slide, please. Then we need this Logitech system, which has its own camera. And this is the camera that play, that's plays on the uh, operator's hands. 
there is a speaker that they can hear what I'm doing. And then this portion is a mini computer which collects the data from the endoscope tower, from the laptop, and transmits it to the internet. Next slide, please. This is connected, this small computer is connected to, a, uh, to any monitor that we can see what's happening inside to split the screen into two, into a split screen or a quad screen, or uh, it combines the input from the laptop, from, the, um, uh, from this camera, and transmits it to the internet. All of this is completely wireless. So this is all done by, uh, by wireless internet connection. Next slide, please. Now the cost component is, this is the most important, this Logitech rally system. It cost about $3,000. The lapel microphone, $165. The Energenie converter, $425. And you need a laptop with an SDI card, with an AVG card that will allow all this connection to occur. So the total cost is less than $4,000 for the entire equipment for, uh, for doing remote endoscopy teaching. Next slide, please. And here is a, um, can we run that video? Here is a uh, polyp that we took off uh, in the Kirubira Surgical Center, all done remotely. Next slide, please. And here is a colonoscopy that I'm doing. I Listen. Like I'm making a loop. Yes, you are. But uh, sometimes you have to make a loop to keep going. Now I can see how much scope is in. If it looks like it's too much of a loop, we have to pull back again and straighten out the scope. And I'm watching all the time what happens so I know how he's torn. I'm on the big control all the time to keep the lumen in view. Keep pulling back, keep pulling back. Don't be timid about it. We can always get to this point again, but we have to pull back a lot. Pull back. Take out a little bit of air. So this is just as if I'm next to him right there in the endoscopy room. Okay, down, down, down with the tip. Down the tip, okay. So this time I pulled back counterclockwise. Yep, okay, sometimes counterclockwise helps. That's good, we're, we're doing, we're taking the loop out now, up with the tip. You have to make, make sure that you use your tip control all the time as you use torque so that you can keep the lumen in view. Now we don't know where the lumen is, so just pull back a little bit more. Pull back a little bit more. There, okay. Now we know where the lumen is. Yeah. Okay. Advance it in. Very good, very good. Okay, uh, so this demonstrates the ability to instantaneously communicate with the operator uh, via the Zoom platform. I can see what he's doing with his hands. I can see what's happening inside. But I'd like to now show you something we did last week, uh, which is introduction of a new technique. And it was fairly easy, but um, one of my fellows, Yakira David at Mount Sinai, join me in the first application of remote variceal banding from New York to Uganda. Next slide, please. Yeah, it feels like I'm making Next a loop. Slide. Here's Yakira. <laughs> Because some of them almost look like they have a, what we call a red wheel sign, which is those sort of reddish spots on mm -hmm. them, which indicate they are at high risk of rebleeding. So let's spend some time because you'll start banding 
distally. So we'll be bonding, we'll be bonding distally down here, which would okay. decompress, which would be the goal of decompressing the entire column of varices in acquisition. And right. then you hold down your suction. Yeah. And while you're holding on your suction, never let it go. Then you fire one okay. band on it. So good. Apply suction now. Suction, suck a lot. Suction sucked in. Yeah, let's let's uh, deploy the band. So deploy. So keep the suction down, and then with your right hand, let somebody hold the scope. Deploy. Okay. Yeah, right, right here. there. Good yeah. job. Now find another Stop. varix nice. and do the same thing. Okay. Okay, so this is a uh, representation of uh, how we can introduce a new technique uh, that hadn't been done before. And this is the first time that uh, they, you, they were able to do banding of esophageal varices under very close supervision between us here in uh, the New York area and Uganda. So I think it's a feasibility. Next slide, please. Next slide. So it's possible, it's feasible, it's relatively inexpensive. It's really just like being in the same endoscopy room with the operator. New techniques and new procedures can be taught. However, it does require time and patience on both ends of the internet. The, the instructor, the mentor must set aside time to, uh, to be there for the entire procedure. But the trainer no longer has to spend a long time, days and weeks away from home. And no, there's no need for flights, hotels, different food or tourista. We can now do it all. Just do it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, really illuminating uh, presentation. Uh, congratulations to you and your team. Um, I think this is very impressive. And we can only hope that such an in initiative can be extended to other uh, remote sites within Africa. So before I introduce the next speaker, I would like to remind the attendees that you can type in your questions uh, in the provision there and we will direct them to uh, the panelists later. So now um, let me introduce the next speaker, Dr. Michael Machiro, who is a consultant general surgeon and director of the endoscopy unit at Tenwick Hospital, Bomet in Kenya. He's a founder member of AFRIC and one of the top esophageal cancer researchers in, in Africa. He's uh, also currently serving on the ASGE International Committee and the International Editorial Board for GIE. Within Africa, uh, Dr. Machiro has been very instrumental in, in the uh, STENT program for AFRIC and also linking AFRIC to several other partners within the continent. I must say that as uh, African scientists, we're really very proud of uh, Dr. Machiro as he represents us on the international platform. Dr. Machiro. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kayamba, for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today to talk about the AFREX Stent Access Initiative. Um, my name is uh, Michael Machiro. I'm a surgeon at Tenue. And so just to get us going, um, Dr. Dorsey had given us a brief overview of this at the beginning of uh, the talk. Uh, the member said, and these were the same places that we were doing this Stent Access project. Um, so some prior work that we have done uh, just particularly on stenting over the last two decades, uh, have been focusing on the introduction of stents uh, without using fluoroscopic assistance. So a majority of them we were looking, actually all our cases we've been doing mainly with direct visualization. And in the last 10 years, we've switched to doing the technique that uses measurements only. Um, and there've been a number of studies, including looking at the small versus large stents, uh, looking at stenting in uh, proximal tumors, and question, I'm now currently doing outcomes of patients who've been stented compared to other modalities. 
So I'll demonstrate the non-fluoroscopic stain technique very briefly. Uh, the first step is uh, usually you pass down the endoscope, you localize the tumor. If you're able to pass the scope, then it's much easier. But if you're unable to, uh, then you have to pass a guide wire through. Uh, so this is done gently. Uh, and the key thing is to ensure that the wire slides smoothly. And once you have enough length of wire across the stricture and into the stomach, then you can move to the next step, which is tumor dilation. Uh, at the beginning of uh, this uh, projects, we used to do this without sedation, but now almost all our patients get sedation um, to make this process much easier. And as you can see here, the dilator is slid gently over the guide wire, and we do serial dilation from 18 French and work our way up to 36 French. The dilator has gone smoothly, and so we move on to the next stage, which is passing the endoscope down and then determining the tumor length. Here you can see wire coiled in the stomach. Uh, the examination has been completed already. We're just focusing on getting the tumor length and the endoscope is pulled back gently. We record the squamous columnar junction. And you can see this tumor is quite friable. The guide wire is in place. And then you find the distal margin of the tumor, which is right there. We go for a little bit until we are quite sure we have the exact distal margin. And then the rest is now to pull back the endoscope, uh, at the same time looking for fistulas, um, assessing how much of the esophagus is involved, uh, with tumor, how friable it is, and then we find the proximal margin and record that. Once you have the two measurements, then the next step becomes much easier because now all you have to do is to decide based on the length what type of stent you're going to use um, and uh, what, what uh, diameter you're going to use and whether it is a proximal versus a distal release. Uh, because of the partnership that we've had with Boston Scientific, we've now been using this stent uh, for this stent uh, Access Initiative project for all our trainings and also for clinical care. So you can see here, the stent is lubricated gently uh, and slid over the wire. Uh, and usually we go beyond the stricture and then pull back a little bit. Uh, the next step is to ensure that you've gone to the exact place where you want it to be marked. We usually give a margin of around two centimeters above the top of the tumor. Uh, the assistant verifies that we are at the mark. Uh, the endoscopist verifies. And then once everyone has agreed, we secure the stent delivery system in place, and then uh, you deploy the stent. Now for this particular stent, the deployment is simply pulling on the uh, string that is attached until the stent has completely released. And once that is done, usually you wiggle the stent a little bit, uh, the delivery system a little bit, and then you pull out uh, the stent delivery uh, sheet. Once the stent has been deployed, then the next step is to confirm positioning. And as you can see in this view, the endoscope is passed down. Uh, we can see the stent opened successfully, the wire is removed and the top of the stent is recorded. And in this particular instance, there was no need to do any additional maneuvers and the procedure is finished. So I'll now switch to talk about the stent training progress uh, project. One of the first things we did was to do site visits. So we went around all the four countries that were participating, we went to Tanzania, went to Malawi, went to Zambia, and uh, then went to Tenrec. This is a picture of Tenrec Hospital. And while at each of these sites, we looked at a number of things. Um, first of all, we talked to the endoscopists about what are the barriers that they were facing uh, for access to uh, stents in those parts. And as you can see, these were in different levels. At uh, the patient level, uh, there were issues to do with low health literacy, the stigma around the cancer diagnosis. Patients had to go long distances to get endoscopy units prioritization of other competing responsibilities, both at the hospital, uh, patient level like childcare and generation of income, and then the cost of high quality stents. The next barrier uh, level was hospital level, and here it was really availability of the medical devices, uh, where mainly they were dependent on donations or ad hoc procurement. There was deprioritization of devices, so the hospital spends on other things as opposed to the needed stents. And there's limited endoscopy equipment and where there was indeed equipment then there was other issue of limited access to endoscopy repair services. And then we noticed there's a limited number of trained endoscopists who are competent to deploy these stents. The system level issues were mainly the cost of supply of the stents, having many patients uh, who's now are exceeding the supply of stents, inadequate insurance cover, uh, bureaucracy and expense of the device registration and regulatory processes, and then a number of issues regarding uh, transparency and reliability in the stent procurement system. 
After this, the next thing we looked at was now, now that we're ready to set up this pro project, we looked at the guiding principles. And as you can see here, there are five main categories. Uh, the first category was the prioritization of the sites for participation. So they had to be members of HAFREC. They had to have a capacity to align the procurement processes. They had to high volume of uh, patients with cancer. And then uh, they were, should be motivated to be able to uh, have the hospital sustain the procurement process. Um, then at the, for the criteria for putting sites, uh, all they had to do is ensure they had an endoscopy unit that was functioning and being able to host training back home once we had done the initial training. And then we ensure that they were able to recruit uh, patients uh, and they were located where patients could reach them. For the trainers, uh, essentially we chose skilled endoscopists who are competent. And then we looked at cultural com competencies, uh, essentially because this was key to keep this going. Uh, so we had the preference for instructors who had prior collaborations at these Africa sites. And then we needed them to have accountability for continue to provide mentorship and feedback to the project. Um, for trainees, essentially uh, they were competent in routine endoscopy. So we started with other surgeons or GI endoscopists, and then uh, having a high interest to pursue this once the STEM training has been done and leadership to continue education. We also added a component for accountability and reporting, whereby we collected data on the training that had happened, the outcomes, and we have started a registry, which I'll talk about later. And then we made sure that they had a willingness to do quarterly audits or report data as it was requested. This uh, schematic shows the developmental framework. And I think the main thing that I want to highlight in this uh, slide, which is a bit busy, is this part where we did an analysis of the market demand. So we partnered with the Clinton Health Access Initiative uh, who had done a lot of chemotherapy work in Africa and they helped us to develop a model. Um, we looked at the demand that we needed, which was going to be around 3,000 for all the countries per year. And then the next step was to identify an industry partner. And in this case, we talked to a number of stent uh, companies, we solicited, solicited engagement and eventually Boston Scientific uh, uh, agreed to partner with us and we therefore launched this at actually one of the DDW conferences uh, in the last two years. And therefore they agreed to provide this tents uh, at a subsidized price for this region. And due to this collaboration, we've been able to uh, supply the stents and maintain that uh, uh, supply going forward. So here I'll just highlight the training, the trainer model. Uh, so we started at Tenek Hospital and the trainers were myself, Dr. Fleischer, Dr. Mark Topazian. And then uh, we went to Tanzania where our first two trainees who had come to Tenek, Dr. Rimbo and Dr. Kitembo, uh, did training while there and we watched them do the stents. And just recently, actually, uh, during the pandemic last year, they were able to do another set of training entirely on their own. And this just goes to show uh, the multiplicative uh, process that this uh, project has had. So each of the countries is working its way through this same model. Uh, this montage just shows uh, the different aspects of the training. Uh, this was a tenwork uh, demonstrating these are the first two trainers, trainees. Um, and then we went to Tanzania. And here we had the team from Boston Scientific help us to go through the device. And here we were looking at the different discussions about uh, stent selection, stent diameter, stent length. And here we watched the two trainees uh, deploy stents. So as I conclude, um, these pictures are from the pre-COVID era. We were in Malawi. This was one of the last trainings. And here we were working with the endoscopy nurses and the endoscopists were there. And we spent three days just doing this process of uh, going through the stent training and watching them do the stents. Here we're doing discussions about how the stent performs. And you can see part of the team there. So what is the future? Um, one is the stent registry. We started this and we are logging all stents that are being placed. We are tracking the stents and we're doing touch day follow-up with patients as quality control. Uh, for this, we partnered with UCSF to develop this red cap access uh, portal. And then we have research and outcome studies that are ongoing. And these are there for looking at therapies for spheroid cancer across the sites in East Africa, depending on resource availability. And we're looking at the different modalities here uh, stenting, radiation, chemotherapy, chemoradiation, spagectomy, or brachytherapy. And we do follow up at 30 days, three months, six months, one year, and five years. Uh, so what are the opportunities for collaboration? Um, one is involvement of multiple players, like uh, what we're doing with SG. Uh, Dr. Topazin talked about the endoscopy survey to assess endoscopic capacity. There's really a big need for training in other aspects of endoscopy, like ERCP, EUS, management of upper GI bleeds and uh, polypectomy. And as you saw from Dr. Wei's presentation, there's additional role for collaboration. Uh, equipment access is a big issue. And then I talked about research and we'd really invite people who 
are interested to join us and participate in the future STEM trainings that we'll have. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, we look forward to continued collaborations and we're really grateful to the ASG for this platform to be able to share our work. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, what we'll do now is uh, Dr. Kayamba and I will uh, uh, oversee the questions. I wanted to mention to the audience uh, as well as to the speakers, although it's uh, <clears throat> 59 minutes after the hour and we're due to end at the hour, uh, <clears throat> we have a few extra minutes. I wanna make sure everyone knows not only will we get to each of the questions, but before we end the session, uh, you'll have the email addresses of all the different panelists available to you. So that if uh, you have a question that wasn't answered properly, then uh, we'll make sure that it gets answered. I'm gonna ask uh, Dr. Kayamba to direct the first question and then we'll just go back and forth. And if you'll pick a panelist and when you choose a certain panelist, they can answer, but of course, uh, anyone else can contribute to this. So uh, um, uh, Violet, if you wanna start the questions, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much, David. So the first question is on uh, tobacco and alcohol. And it says, how can SGE members and others throughout the community address trends related to patient education with tobacco and alcohol consumption as anticipate this uh, significantly elevated the ins uh, elevates incidence. And the next question probably could uh, tackle them together in view of time is asking our how best to address differences in incidence between genders and whether gender associated behaviors and exposures are likely to be implicated. Uh, um, Dr. Dorsey, would you like to, to attempt to address these two questions? Uh, sure, I'll try. Um, the, uh, the question about tobacco and alcohol, as, as we know, tobacco and alcohol are extremely important in low-risk countries. And as I, I mentioned, in high-risk countries, they seem to be less important. Probably this is because people don't have enough money to uh, buy tobacco and alcohol as, as we do. Um, we've done four, we have preliminary data from four case control studies now in, in Africa, and all four of them show no association with tobacco consumption. This is probably because people uh, roll their own and they, they you know, a, a smoker smokes about five cigarettes a day, something like this. Uh, for alcohol, only one of the case control studies showed a strong association. The other three showed none. Um, uh, clearly, tobacco and alcohol are very important, and they as people get more um, uh, get more money, they will it, it will become more important. Um, I, I don't know how uh, people in the GI community can affect this except by uh, talking individually to patients that that their tobacco and alcohol consumption is, 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 is bad for them. As far as gender specific exposures, uh, the, the main exposures for, that we see in, in high risk countries for men uh, include um, uh, this uh, hot uh, con consumption of hot drinks. They, it's, it's a sort of a macho thing and people want to drink uh, tea or porridge uh, hotter than um, than the next person. And so, uh, so that's important. Also, the smoking and drinking that is taking place is almost exclusively among men. For women, the great majority of the, we think the biggest exposure is indoor air pollution from cooking uh, on open fires in, in kitchens or in cooking rooms that are virtually unventilated. And the, wall, the walls throughout the room are completely black and the ceilings are too. And you can go with your finger and there's soot all over your finger. Um, and we've shown with look, uh, looking at urine metabolites uh, of PAHs that the, the women have, have levels that are twice that of the men. And that's because they do all the cooking. So uh, they, they seem to be, have different exposures based on gender. So um, I'd like to um, <clears throat> address this question to Dr. Wei. And uh, one of the uh, audience participants points to a uh, publication in the literature that talks about mislesions with uh, finding adenocarcinoma in the United States in a group of Barrett's. And, and of course, uh, you're quite familiar with the issue of mislesions with, um, with colon cancer, Jerry. Um, 
is your sense that um, with this remote program, you have ways that would be comparable to addressing that question, uh, your thoughts about the question in general, both with colon cancer and esophageal cancer. And I guess it's a question of commentary about both mislesions, number one, and uh, whether the remote uh, process uh, uh, would increase the likelihood. So if you can uh, take that, that would be great, Jerry. I think that introduction of endoscopy, no matter where it is, whether it's in an endoscopy center uh, and uh, the instructor can be right next to the student or whether it's 6,000 miles away, doesn't really make much difference. It's, uh, it's dependent on the observational propensity of the instructor and student uh, that allows one to identify and pick up abnormalities that may be dysplastic lesions or adenomas. And I think that uh, that's only a matter of experience and uh, careful mentoring that allows us to find lesions that may be difficult to, uh, to see. But certainly there's no doubt that uh, even in the best of hands, we miss a number of adenomas. How bad, however, they're usually fairly small, uh, the ones that are missed in the colon. And with this new advent of, uh, of artificial intelligence, uh, it's picking up a lot more tiny little lesions that one may miss on visual inspection alone. However, I think that it all depends on developing the skill and technique of being able to look behind folds. And I think all of this can be done in a remote training session while the instructor does not have to be right next to the student in the same room. We can now do it far remote and do it just as well. Vi, you want to take the next question for one of the uh, speakers? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, there's this one, which I, I think is directed to uh, Dr. Machiro. It's uh, the attendees asking about complications related to uh, stent placements, uh, including um, stent migration, tumor ingrowth, uh, bleeding, and so on. Is that an also, the next part of the question is asking about chemotherapy. But first, I'll ask you, uh, Dr. Machiro, to comment on the complications with the stenting. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, so what we have been seeing is the most common complication that we see is the tumor overgrowth. And this is what brings them in usually after you've put in the stents and they go home. Uh, the way our model is set up is they get the stent and then they go home and they're enrolled into palliative care or they get the stent and they go get their treatment and then come back for surgery. So we've been using stents as a bridge to surgery. In the initial phase, um, usually most, the main, the main issue is uh, pain. Uh, occasionally we've had uh, some bleeding if the tumor is friable. Uh, but not that much, and we've not had many perforations. I think we've been able to show that the technique is easily reproducible, and if you follow the principles, um, that it's it's been fairly safe. The long-term uh, complications, so delayed complications, is what in the initial set of data we actually are about to submit for publication because of our model, we didn't have much of that available, but in the next study that is going on, we are now doing very uh, rigorous follow-up. And so we'll be able to give a more uh, in-depth uh, look at this in the next set of things that we publish, because now we're actually following these patients and tracking them. Uh, but overall, I can say uh, the other comment is uh, this question of combining treatment when they're on stents. So, and this is where the oncologists are split about what direction to take. So some of the data shows that it's okay to do this. Uh, there's actually some data out there about uh, stents that have been imbued with radioactive beads. 
uh, but that oncology bit, some of them are not very keen on radiating patients with stents because after you shrink the tumor, the argument is that it might uh, slide downwards into the stomach. Um, yeah, so I think, thank you for the question. That's, that's a really good aspect of this stent care that we've been handling here. I uh, <clears throat> will have a question for Dr. Tapazian, and then unless there's any other questions that are put forth by the audience, um, we'll uh, wrap up the session so people can get on with their daily lives. Before doing so, uh, uh, on behalf of Dr. Kamba and ourself, we want to thank the panelists. As I say, if you know this topic, you know you've had uh, four of the most knowledgeable people in the world and the most uh, gracious people in the world make those presentations. Uh, we wanted to thank the ASG for putting on this uh, global spotlight program so that Africa can uh, uh, share some of the things that we've done. Uh, we want to thank the ASG staff in particular and the guy behind the scenes who really has made all this happen is Reddy Jakova, who's the Director of Global Communications for the ASG and through many interactions with Reddy, um, I can tell you he's a, a great asset for the ASG and, and has certainly been helpful for us. Um, a reminder that in uh, two or three days, this will appear on GI Leap, which is on the ASG website. And uh, you can see the whole presentations in full. And if some of your colleagues didn't attend this, uh, they can uh, pick it up at a later date. And then uh, uh, just finally to mention that you have the email addresses of the six individuals who've been involved in this. And I know, uh, speaking for the other five, um, everyone will be happy to take uh, questions that you want to send in offline uh, that may be valuable. Uh, to close, I'll uh, uh, posit a question to Dr. Tapazian, and if she can answer this one in addition to her doctoral and postdoctoral work, she'll be in line for the Nobel Prize, I'm sure. But Hillary, I want to ask you, you put out all these different barriers and uh, is someone who's involved in public health and epidemiology and global health. Um, some of those barriers or many of those barriers seemed uh, insurmountable. And since uh, the way you solve problems in the world use is you know, one footstep at a time, what, what would you see Hillary as some next steps that might address some of the barriers that you put forward? If you can answer that, please Hillary. Great. Well, I guess from what I've seen and what we've all seen through the presentations today, AFRIC is already doing a great job in working on some of these gaps. Um, I mentioned cost and endoscopy equipment as being some of the top barriers and also personnel, so lack of trained support staff and endoscopists. And we've seen videos showing how train the trainers and um, training people who are the ones performing endoscopy even remotely um, can be an effective strategy. Um, I know some of our other activities include working with ministries of health um, and connecting governments with uh, manufacturers and equipment providers to try and get reduced um, pricing for those and try and, I guess, shorten the supply chain um, so things can just go over more directly. Um, so I think those are some of the major steps that I see already in place and already working on filling these gaps. Thank you, Hillary. Uh, with uh, that, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Kayamba for co-chairing this, and uh, we'll proceed to end the session now with great gratitude to the audience for participating, the speakers for coming, and ready for his hard work. Thanks to all, and over and out we go. Thank you. Uh, thank you so thank much, you. Dr. Dr. Fletcher, Dr. Kayamba, and Dr. Dossi, and Dr. Topkazi, and Dr. Wei, and Dr. Machiro for these uh, excellent and informative presentations and, and for being uh, with, with, with us today. Um, and just before we close out, I will launch a very quick poll to check the quality of this presentation. Um, it'll take just a few seconds. Uh, your experience with these learning events is, is important to ASG and we want to make sure that we are offering interactive sessions that fit your educational needs. Um, at the conclusion of this webinar, if you could also go to the networking lounge, we have added a quick survey that takes less than a minute to complete. We greatly appreciate your, your, your help with that as well. How do they get to the networking lounge?
It's through the virtual platform. There is uh, the navigating uh, uh, bar at the bottom. There is an icon that says a networking lounge. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I will end the poll. And uh, as, a, as a final reminder, uh, please do check ASG's calendar of events as we will continue to feature relevant session to our Global Spotlight series. Um, and also do check out the DDW session of, of AFRIC that is uh, happening on Sunday, May 23rd from 10 to 11.30 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. Um, in closing, thank you again to our panelists and moderators for this excellent presentation, and thank you to our audience for making this session interactive. We hope this information has been useful to you in your practice, and we'll now conclude this session. Thank you so much. <laughs>